But for this to happen, another final factor would have to come into play, and that was the contribution of someone who not only had the technical ability, but the boldness and courage to take risks in the studio. Risks taken in order to meet the challenges of capturing sonically the increasingly potent and experimental ideas the Beatles were coming up with. In George Martin, they had found a producer, composer and co-collaborator equal in measure to their own talents. But even he had begun to be challenged with how to technically achieve some of the ideas that the Beatles were now coming to him with. What was needed was a brilliant sound engineer, someone who had the ability and the willingness to embrace experimentation and find ways to bring technically the ideas to life. In 19-year-old Jeff Emmerich, they found their man, and it was he who was to play a crucial role in developing the Beatles' sound, not only on Revolver, but on much of the Beatles' recordings moving forward. Nowhere was this more evident than on the first track to be laid down, and the closing song on the album, Tomorrow Never Knows. The song was a giant leap forward for the Beatles with virtually no harmonies, and based on the continuous droning sound cut with thunderous drums, and lyrics adapted from Timothy Leary and Richard Alford's adaptation of the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Technically, it was a tremendous challenge, specifically with the incorporation of tape loops and backwards recordings. There were five tape loops audible on Tomorrow Never Knows. What sounds like Siegel squawking, but is actually a distorted and sped up recording of Paul McCartney laughing. An orchestral chord of B-flat major taken from a vinyl recording owned by Paul, which stands as one of the earliest examples of sampling. A fast electric guitar phrase in C major, reversed and played at double speed. Some Mellotron voicings believed to be strings and brass. and a distorted sitar, which is most clearly heard in the instrumental break following the lines, it is being, it is being. In order for the tape loops to be recorded onto the backing track, George Martin devised a way for all five tape loops to be playing simultaneously, and through the use of faders on a mixing desk, bring them up in order to be recorded into the mix. This, however, required that he, along with the Beatles and Jeff Emmerich, all man the mixing desk controls and essentially perform as if it was an instrument in itself while the backing track played, bringing up the faders at the correct time in order to create the instrument sounds they wanted for the mix. So in the end, the actual mix of Tomorrow Never Knows is a performance which can not ever be recreated the same way again. The technical challenges, however, did not stop there, and another involving trying to satisfy John Lennon's request that he sound like the Dalai Lama chanting from the top of a hilltop. John had proposed that in order to achieve the effect, that he be suspended above the studio in a harness and spun around in the air so that the microphone would capture his voice each time he passed. George Martin realised that this was not feasible and looked to Jeff Emmerich, who devised the far more practical solution of running Lennon's voice through a revolving Leslie speaker, more commonly found inside Hammond organs. By putting his voice through the speaker and then re-recording it again, they were able to achieve the intermittent vibrato effect John was after, and can be heard in the second part of the song from the line, Love is all and love is everyone onwards. had ever been recorded or sounded like it up until that point. 